Grace and mercy and peace are yours from the triune God. Amen. I hope you don't mind I come down here a little bit and be a little bit closer with y'all. I draw on a number of quotes this morning. I'll get to that. From wisdom of women and men whose insights I trust will be memorable for you. For example, here's one from Oliver Wendell Holmes. A person's mind, stretched with new ideas, may never again return to its original dimensions. I have a goal this morning to stretch your minds a little bit. In particular, I hope the way that you happen to look at the world may never go back to some of its original dimensions. Moreover, I'm going to give you my main point up front. Is that okay? Here it is. There is no lack. You have everything that you need of God's resources, both on earth and in heaven. Superabundance is everywhere. Superabundance is everywhere, even if sometimes superabundance disguises itself as scarcity and lack. So it is that Jesus gives this command to Philip and the rest of the disciples. You give them something to eat. You give them. That certainly is a bold assertion. It assumes, Jesus assumes, that they have the wherewithal, they have everything that they need in order to give. However, the only thing that they see are the five loaves and the two fish. In John's gospel, Philip is taken aback. He says, wait a minute. Well, I added those words, wait a minute. He said, six months wages couldn't buy enough for each one of them to get just a little. In rough language, Philip is saying to Jesus, you gotta be kidding me. And the other disciples protest as much. The apostle John says that Jesus told Philip to feed the people in order to test him. You see, after all their glowing reports to Jesus about their various mission activities, how even the devils had subjected themselves to them, today, at the end of the day, at the time of this apparent food crisis, did Philip and the other disciples really believe that they had at their fingertips, their serving fingertips, the resources of earth and heaven they would need in order to fulfill the command you give them something to eat. Apparently not. Where the disciples see scarcity, Jesus sees abundance. Jesus has his eye, his vision set on those 12 baskets full after everyone has eaten. They fed up to 10,000 to 20,000 people, which now includes the women and children. Both the belief and the feeling of deficit and deficiency and inadequacy and lack and scarcity and suffering reign strong. Despite walking with Jesus and despite the occasional spiritual successes that they had, a fixed belief in lack remains in the DNA of the disciples all the way to the end. Remember, for example, at the Last Supper, Jesus turned to Philip and said, Have you been with me for so long a time and you still don't recognize me? He who sees me has seen the Father. Although he shares with them that all of the life and resources of Father God remain with them forever in the person of Jesus, they still don't understand. So I sympathize with the disciples. I don't know about you, but I admit that pretty much I muddle through life with the exact same kind of inadequacy blockers running at full bore. Paul exhorts the Roman Christians to not to be conceited, not to be conceited, but to think of them, uh, to think of themselves as they ought, as they ought to think with sober minds, evaluating themselves with sober judgments. 
But in terms of God's valuation, it does no good for any of us to think of ourselves less than we should either. That too is not sober thinking. Simply put, a commitment to inadequacy and lack is actually the same thing as a commitment to pride and conceit, only in reverse. But see here in today's gospel how inadequacy and scarcity run rampant, where the disciples have to tell Jesus to send the people away in order to get something to eat. The implication is that nobody anywhere has enough food, not really enough. They may, they may have some, they may have a few loaves here, a few fish there, but not enough for a real meal. And besides that, it's getting late. The idea of scarcity is so strong that it takes command even after an entire day of Jesus teaching and curing and doing the exact opposite. So it all has to do, it all boils down to the things that we believe. According to what we believe, we shape the world around us and it conforms itself to that. We see whatever it is that we're looking for. Ideas have consequences. What you think about expands. What you believe determines how you live because what you believe, in fact, determines your reality. So if you believe that a person or a thing is horrible, undesirable, catastrophic, unbearable, unpleasant, repulsive, utterly hopeless, then you will speak, speak and choose and feel and experience it in a way that moves you toward fear and the need to avoid it. But if, on the other hand, you believe that a person or a thing is good or right or important or proper or absolutely essential, then you will speak and believe and live and think in a way that tends toward welcoming that and enjoying that. Long ago, I read this unattributed quote that had stayed with me pretty much my whole life long. It says this, the optimist believes that we live in the best possible world. The pessimist fears this is true. <laughs> Napoleon Hill says, whether you think you can or you think you can't, you're right. Earl Nightingale tells us the strangest secret is that you are what you think about all day long. And then think about what JFK said. You remember the words. Some people see things that are as they are and say, why? I dream of things that never were and say, why not? Then too, here's this little poem by Ella Wheeler Wilcox, which I'm going to quote for you in part. I hold it true that thoughts are things, endowed with bodies, breath, and wings, and that we send them forth to fill the world with good results or ill. That which we call secret thought speeds to the earth's remotest spot and leaves its blessings or its woes like tracks behind it as it goes. Then let your secret thoughts be fair. They have a vital part and share in shaping worlds and molding fate. God's system is so intricate. Do we see abundance or do we see lack? Do we see resource or limitation and depletion? Do we see capability or inadequacy, truth or falsehood? Meaning a false sense of reality. Again, we tend to see whatever it is that we're looking for. In this world, there's truth and there's falsehood. But since in God's view, only the truth is real, then falsehood is false and unreal and in fact, as far as God's concerned, non-existent. A Course in Miracles says nothing real can be threatened, nothing unreal exists. Herein lies the peace of God. It also says that this course does not aim at the teaching, teaching the meaning of love, for that's beyond what, uh, beyond what can be taught. It does aim, however, at removing the blocks to the awareness of love's presence, which is your natural inheritance. 
The opposite of love is fear, but what is all-encompassing can have no opposite. What is all-encompassing can have no opposite. If you have all the resources that you need, that means you have all the resources that you need. There is no opposite. You have what you need. I wonder if we can just really grasp this. Begin to really live it. The miracle is, as Dr. Wayne Dyer puts it, if you change the way you look at things, the things you look at change. In today's story, the only possibility that exists for Jesus is 12 large baskets of leftovers. He had the power to see things differently. Wait a minute, Pastor Dwayne. I still get hungry for food. I still suffer from pain and disease and limitation and depletion. Are you telling me that if I just try to stop believing in those things, those negative things, they'll just go away? Well, kind of, I guess. <laughs> After all, you are what you think about all day long. At least you should try to avoid any kind of negative thinking that exacerbates those things. Take sadness, for example. When you feel sad over a sudden loss or a grief, your sad feelings are your own definite reality. They are as solid as a rock, as real as stone. But then consider the million year view of things. Your immediate present reality of feeling that sadness can't hold a candle over against the million-year view of reality, the eternal reality of unrelenting love and peace and joy and resource of God in heaven. That's why the Bible describes God's reality with the words, See, the home of God is among mortals. He will dwell with them and they will be his people and God himself will be with them and wipe away every tear from their eyes and there shall be no more death. Pain will be no more because the first things have passed away. Okay, there's another way of summing up all this stuff that I've been telling you, reframing it a little. And that's to say this, the only reality is love. Love is all there is. Love is all you have. Love is all you need, and love is all you have to share and to give, and love is a goal that can never be blocked. Somebody can stand in your path and say, no, 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 I don't want that. I don't want your love, but that never prevents you from giving it away. And the more you give, the more you have to give, as the saying goes. Remember in the reading, Jesus is moved with compassion toward the crowd. That Greek word for moved with compassion is a single word, which means to be sick to the stomach with love. To be lovesick. To be gut-wrenched, it says. Jesus loved and thus he used the simple gifts that were at his disposal and they just multiplied. And you, dear people of God, have been given all the gifts of grace that you may need to ever have need of for yourselves or to share with others. Five loaves, two fish, bread, water, and wine, body and blood, deepest forgiveness by which you free yourselves and then you free and feed a starving world, love lost world. So I'm gonna close this morning with words from those great theologians, George Gershwin and Frank Sinatra. <laughs> love walked right in and drove the shadows away. Love walked right in and brought my sunniest day. One magic moment my heart seemed to know that love said hello, though not a word was spoken. One look and I forgot the gloom of the past. One look and I found my future at last. One look 
and I had found a world completely new when love walked in with you. Love walks in with you. Every time, everywhere, always. Amen. Our hymn of the day. <laughs> 